Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Hello everyone, thank you for coming to this talk um, on the history of uh, accident and emergency rooms and my name is Graham Mooney, I'm from the Department of the History of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. I'm currently working on a book um, about the spatial aspects of modern medicine, how space and place influence the delivery of healthcare and medical services, and how medical services and the delivery of healthcare influence our experiences of space and place. And the emergency room is one of the spaces that I'm interested in. So I'm going to be looking at the emergency room from a geographer's perspective, even though I'm in a history of medicine department. I originally trained as a geographer, and that's where my interest in space and place comes from. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you about this, some of my, share some of my ideas with you. And I'd very much like to thank uh, Daisy Cunningham at the uh, RCPE and the media team who have enabled this recording to take place. So um, let's get going, shall we? Um, I want to start with um, an image. In 1980, in 1980 Eugene Richards, who was a photographer uh, who had done assignments for Life magazine uh, and the New York Times magazine, went to Denver Hospital, uh, Denver General Hospital in Colorado in the United States to do an assignment on an emergent, urban American emergency department for Geo magazine. In the facilities, trauma and medicine rooms and ambulances, um, Richards witnessed birth, death, and pretty much everything in between, laughter, joy and healing, violence, suffering and desperation. Here's an example of some of the things that he observed. The blood on the floor of room two has an unreal black lacquer shine. On the table is a boy who was thrown from his motorcycle. Without the airway clamp between his teeth, he'd probably be handsome. At 10.31, 30 minutes after he came in, the boy was pronounced dead. All but one of the room lights are shut off and the doors are closed. I know I shouldn't be in the room, not being staff or family, but after seeing him die, I can't leave. My job's not done yet. I make a photograph as Father Riley recites a prayer over the dead boy. Then I photograph the janitor picking up the bloody rags and washing down the table before I back out of the room. This extract didn't actually come from the Geo magazine who'd sent Richards off to do the assignment. The editors of the Geo magazine didn't have the stomach for the sorts of stories like this that Richards wanted to tell, and so they chose not to run the story in the end. In fact, this quote comes from Richards 1989 book, The Knife and Gun Club. After Geo magazine got cold feet, Richards befriended some of the staff at the hospital and he kept going back to the hospital. And this remarkable book was the result. Now, there are many things that I could say about the Knife and Gun Club. And incidentally, the Knife and Gun Club was the term locals gave um, the, the general hospital's emergency room. The book is by turns a, an amazing photo essay, an oral history, and compelling theater. Um, and in her book, Bodies at Risk, Carol Squires remarks that with his steering, searing images, uh, Richards represents the sudden, scary, urgent flow of wounds, attacks, and eruptions. In turn, inspires another flow of people and procedures that can seem haphazard and brutal. The photographs, she goes on, show the way in which bodies move or are moved through the emergency system in the wake of accidents, illnesses, criminal acts, or attempts at self-harm. So even though we have static images here, what she's saying is that Rich, Richards is a, amazingly good at capturing uh, movement. And speed is one of Richards' themes. The night is picking up speeds, he writes at one point. It's thumping with heart sounds, coughs, cursing, the phones are ringing, 
Doctors are calling out orders. The machines hiss and buzz. I can almost breathe in the noise. Flows and movements obviously characterise these spaces. You can see uh, from this image here the way in which the, the, the trolley is being pushed through the, the space. And flows and movements are actually what characterise spaces and places. They're not, not static entities. They only create uh, are, are an engagement with humans through movement and speed and flow. And I want to try and capture the dynamism of this in this talk and try to understand what it means. In particular, I want to ask how, if at all, has the relentless and unpredictable churning of patients in this space been managed? How and why are decisions made? How are work patterns organised? And how is the space of the accident and emergency room arranged? I'm going to use the work of historians, sociologists, anthropologists and the writings of healthcare professionals themselves to show that the attempt to order this space isn't just the result of clinical efficiency and expediency, nor is the change over time in what this space looked like. The emergency department, or the A&E, um, is a space of sifting, of sorting, and of segregating. And these, these, these processes always reflect some combination of medical, social, moral, and economic reasonings that are reflected in the built form and in the spatial structure. And it's one of the things that gives the emergency room, uh, the accident emergency department, its meaning and makes a distinctive healing space. What I want to begin with is a brief description of the recent history of the modern uh, A&E or emergency room uh, from the early 20th century. I'll then use a description of the operation of uh, uh, Bartholome St Bartholomew's Casualty Room in London at the turn of the 20th century to demonstrate how one procedural aspect of this discipline, triage, has long roots and is beautifully observed in the accident emergency room and is very closely related to the configurations of space uh, in, the, the, in this particular, in, in, in the hospital. So, the casualty room. One thing that we're aware of is that historically, most um, most emergencies or accidents, um, urgent care, was provided for outside of the hospital space up to the beginning of the 20th century, but increasingly so in the 19th century, was the period when we began to look to institutions and hospital space on a large scale for treating our ailments and illnesses. Here you can see an example in 1819 uh, from an image by David Wilkie of a, a young boy having, you know, um, you know, having his uh, cut finger tended to, in, tended to maybe by his grandmother or mother in the home. Very common image uh, and something that we still do today. But remember this image for later on in the talk. As I said, from the late 19th century onwards, you get a, an explosion really of institutional space. Um, in civilian practice, uh, you know, outside of the, the institution, the, the institutions, the concentration of workers uh, involved the creation of the Industrial Revolution in particular, led to large numbers of injuries and associated health problems. The casual ward of the workhouse was a ward that provided special assistance for vagrants or those taken sick on the road. And it also provided shelter and accommodation for labouring people in search for work, particularly labouring men. And these early casualty departments were existed to treat casual attendees as well as real casualties. Lots of general hospitals and voluntary hospitals were also involved in the care of uh, in the care of these kinds of cases. And in 1932, uh, Sir Darcy Power describes uh, the surgical side of the casualty department that had developed at St Bartholomew's Hospital uh, when it was in charge of 
when he himself and uh, Mr. C. B. Lockwood were in charge of it in 1898. And Darcy Power describes how one third of the hall was allotted to the surgical and the rest to the medical casualty patients. The entrance to the hall was by six easy steps, which led from Smithfield through two half glazed doors. On the opposite side of the hall and exactly facing these doors was a small dispensary provided with counters and shut off by sash windows. The dispensary so closely resembled the bar of a public house that many a drunken man was easily persuaded to take a double dose of house physic, thinking it was the last glass before going home. It contained stock medicines brought over from the apothecary's shop in brown stoneware jugs holding two, four, six, eight and twelve gallons apiece. The patients uh, began to assemble on the steps in Smithfield at about 8.30 a.m. But whatever the weather, there was no shelter, as you can see here, and the doors were kept locked until the last stroke of 9 a.m. So already you're having a, a control of the patient base that is coming into the casualty ward. At the last stroke of 9, each door was held ajar to admit one patient at a time. The porter on the male and the nurse on the female side asked each patient what he or she complained of and referred him to the physician or surgeon as was thought fit. The diagnosis was rough and unskilled, but according to Darcy Power, it was correct. Patients coming for the first time were directed to seats on either side of the dispensary where they waited until the assistant surgeon had interviewed them, and you can see uh, the dispensary, uh, the, the 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 dispensary and the waiting room here. And they waited until the surgeon had interviewed them, and the hall was usually filled by ten minutes past nine. And the junior assistant surgeon uh, had to ascertain that the house surgeon was present and on duty. They had eight dressers to assist them, and the senior. Uh, how surgeon would then emerge uh, and would uh, treat the patients um, going through them on the benches where they were sitting. They'd make a rapid diagnosis, ask a few pertinent questions and sorted the patients into roughly, very roughly, into trivial uh, patients, uh, patients that provided teaching material and serious cases. Patients with trivial complaints were handed over to the house surgeon who allotted them amongst his dressers. Cases useful for teaching were sent to the outpatient room where they awaited the arrival of the assistant surgeon at 12.30 p.m. Those who were seriously ill were taken straight onto the ward. Now, when the National Health Service was inaugurated in, 18, in 1948, it inherited a large number of these kinds of casualty departments. And almost without exception, they were housed in substandard premises and in quotes uh, around the back of the hospital. So you know, the, the spatial aspect of the significance of casualty is reflected in the fact that you know, the, 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 the casualty department wasn't the front door of the hospital as we have come to uh, think of it today. Doctors working in these uh, casualty departments had usually been qualified for less than a year and most of the care and treatment was provided by nurses. There was in fact usually a consulting surgeon who was nominally in charge of these casualty departments but according to contemporary accounts they very rarely uh, visited them. So before the 1960s, you know, in the early years of the NHS, casualty departments served primarily as accident rooms where physicians provided basic care to injured patients. Um, nurses and residents tended to manage these rooms uh, and they only sought senior physicians advice and guidance when needed. And outside of these spaces, people rely and continue to rely on general practitioners for some of their um, their emergency care. Back in the United States, uh, around about the same time, one study suggested that only one out of seven hospitals even had an emergency department that could be classed as sufficient. Of 7,000 hospitals, as many as 3,000, it was suggested, couldn't even really be described as anything more than a glorified first aid station. Maybe a nurse on call in the hospital was available. Maybe a physician was available in few minutes. In a few minutes, it was a bit of a lottery, 
Less than half the emergency departments in the United States before the 1960s had any kind of written uh, policies and procedures. And only one uh, out of uh, one in every six had 24 hour coverage by physicians. Only half had any kind of routine staff training in emergency medical procedures. So what this section has been about is how, although the space, yeah, you know, the space of the casualty room pre 1960s um, was very rudimentary. It was, you know, it wasn't a preeminent space uh, in the hospital, um, and it took on uh, a, a a different kind of um, professional, technical. Uh, deeply, um, deeply um, um, important role within the hospital in the 19, from the 1960s and 70s onwards with the emergent rise of emergency medicine as a specialty. But one of the other things to note is that even before that emergency medicine specialty uh, sort of developed in the 1970s, patients were already being sorted and sifted according to their status and what nurses, porters, and doctors thought were important. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that um, in the final section. But um, what I want to do now is talk about the origins of emergency medicine, where that came from, where emergency medicine came from, and why that was so important for the space, for transforming the actual space of the, you know, casualty rooms and uh, emergency rooms. Uh, departments. But in spite of the remarkable organisation which had been built up in the 1914-18 period, is it not true to say that you and your colleagues in preaching the doctrine of the segregation of fracture units met with very great resistance? We did. Surgical specialism was slow to be accepted, particularly in the great teaching hospitals. And it was not until 1934 that I myself uh, was appointed as an orthopaedic surgeon uh, to a teaching hospital, the Manchester Royal Infirmary. So one of the reasons why it took so long for emergency medicine to emerge was a resistance, general resistance to specialism within uh, the medical profession uh, as a whole. And so emergency medicine, as we now recognise it, is a relatively um, new discipline as Sir Harry Platt was um, talking about there in relation to orthopedics. A lot of the early, uh, you know, a lot of the early people who worked, people who worked in casualty rooms and accident emergency rooms were uh, ortho, had an orthopedic specialism. And I'll come on to Harry Platt in a minute. But it's a relatively new discipline in the it, it, even today, and emergency services. Uh, medical services on both sides of the Atlantic. At the time, Harry Platt is speaking here in 1961, um, we're in a dire state uh, in the mid 20th century. There was a recognition that services continued to be chaotic, underfunded, understaffed, and lagging behind other areas of medicine. As patients started to use facilities for non urgent health problems, emergency visits increased astronomically. And in response to rising patient loads, hospital administrators began to devise strategies to improve emergency care. And the first professional body to draw attention to the seriousness of the situation was the British Orthopaedic Association. Their concern eventually resulted in the creation in 1960 of what was termed the Accident Services Review Committee of Great Britain and Ireland, which published reports in 1961 and 65. And concurrently with this, the Ministry of Health um, appointed a subcommittee of the Standing Medical Advisory uh, Committee to consider the organisation of hospital casualty and accident services. Sir Harry Platt, who we just saw in that clip there, was the chairman and produced a report under his name in 1962. And it made, 60, sorry, it made 45 uh, specific recommendations for improving casualty services. And the report was accepted by the Ministry of Health, uh, which gave, then gave instructions for the implementation of its recommendations. And, and you can see some of them here, listed here. Casualty be changed to accident and emergency to give it 
more of a, a, a you know, less of an association with the old poor law casual wards and more of a, you know, an appropriate indicator of the kinds of cases that were being seen. There should be three consultant surgeons, uh, should receive all medical emergencies, not just accident victims. And one of the issues in the 1960s, 1950s and 60s was the increasing number of road traffic accidents. Yeah, this was all, all these debates were happening as road traffic accidents began an exponential rise in the 50s and 60s and before, particularly before seatbelt legislation came into, into being. Um, so they had to be preferably located in general hospitals, uh, patients taken to the appropriate department, not just the nearest one. That's an interesting commentary on what was happening in the past. Um, hopefully, the provision of GP services would reduce the number of minor cases being seen and the number of departments themselves should be reduced. So serving a population of uh, not serving a population of less than 150,000. So what you're seeing here is that is that you're beginning to get a, a sort of standardization of what accident and emergency centers and you know, departments should look like after inheriting this mishmash of spaces in the 19 during the NHS the early beginnings of the NHS you're beginning to get a realization that it was very chaotic let's impose some standards on what these spaces actually do and uh, what they look like another report um, in 1970 was uh, the Clark report uh, which also uh, began to look at um, the, the actual training of uh, people who were becoming accident and emergency specialists. So incorporating um, accident work within medical education uh, and for senior house officers, um, and also providing design of accident units and giving them the, the kind of support such as lab and rehab facilities that other uh, parts of the hospital and other areas of the hospital enjoyed up until uh, the 1970s. And, and, and after this 1970 report, um, there was a joint consultants committee report in 1971, which recommended to the Department of Health and was accepted that 32 experimental consultant posts in accident and emergency medicine be created and they were appointed to work full-time and be responsible for 32 of the major uh, accident and emergency departments in the UK. We well, said um, that you know that the, there were issues and problems uh, in the United States and this was being increasingly reflected in popular, popular literature um, and in as well as in medical and healthcare circles. You can see here um, you know, that there are issues around ambulance, you know, the, the ambulance quality and availability um, in the United States, particularly um, ambulance services quite often uh, were sham nothing less than shambolic. Uh, many funeral services doubled up. The hearses of funeral services uh, and undertaking services doubled up as the, uh, as the ambulance in many settings. Um, and, you know, there was a recognition that, you know, that, that the emergency room lacked the kind of investment and high-tech medical care that was being seen in other parts of the, the hospital as well. But what's important, or what's also necessary uh, to recognise, is that, um, you know, the, the, the emergency room itself was nonetheless becoming a, a space that was recognized um, and fixed in the popular imagination. These two book covers come from 1970, uh, both called The Emergency Room. Um, Eleanor Kay on the left was a, a registered nurse in the US. Um, and you, know, you have another, uh, another book, uh, The Emergency Room uh, by Anita May McRae Fiegels, and here's yet another example from 1983, The Emergency Room by Bob and Diane Wolfe. What's fascinating about these three examples is they're aimed at a juvenile audience, a young audience. And what they, they, they intend to do is help kids and young people understand what would they 
what they'd be able to expect in this new, relatively new thing called the emergency room. And what I think this indicates is that the emergency room has, by the 1970s and 80s, has become a concrete enough spatial identity to actually merit these kinds of books. But it's also new enough and strange enough that it still needs and requires explaining to a young audience. Because in the 1970s and 80s, some children's parents wouldn't have been into one of these, what became fancy newfangled emergency rooms as the specialty of emergency medical practice began to be concretized in the 1970s and 80s. So the, 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 the emergency room was, um, was transformed along with the rise of emergency medicine into with much higher levels of investment um, and awareness about the problems and issues of emergency medicine in the 1970s. And you know, this is a place where triage, as I mentioned earlier, was already instituted and it became a much more significant and triage and sifting and sorting became a much more significant aspect of this new kind of emergency room, much more sophisticated. But the key point, as Anne Merritt has said um, in her um, article on emergency medicine in the 1960s, is that emergency medicine developed as a hospital-based specialty because it was defined exclusively by its location, the hospital uh, emergency room. So I want to look a little bit more about uh, 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 what went on in that room and how the transformation of the emerg an emergence of the emergency the transformation of casualty rooms into accident and emergency uh, departments and emergency rooms um, was characterised by a very sophisticated kind of uh, sifting and sorting. So you have this huge increase in accident and emergency uh, visits. You can see here um, that you know. This is um, from a, an article, interestingly enough, in, in Community Medicine, uh, an early article in that journal uh, from 1980, that, that um, charts the increase in accident and emergency visits um, over a 20-year period, 1956 to 1976. And you can see that um, you know, the rate per thousand visits to A&E departments goes up from 114 to 189, and over the same period, really outpatient clinic visits uh, were pretty stable. Uh, so, so th there's a, there's a, um, a, a an increased pressure, if you like, on accident um, and emergency departments. What to do with all these patients became one of the questions. This is an emergency. Day and night. The ambulances are bringing the sick and badly injured to the hospitals. It's my finger. I'm afraid you'll have to wait. The patient's heart begins to falter. Cardiac arrest. This is an emergency. Actually, I don't think I pulled a muscle. This is an emergency. If the heart team can get there in time, they can save a life. Excuse me. I'm afraid you'll have to wait. Anyone who goes to an emergency department will be seen. But the real emergencies come first. And you may have to wait. So contact your own doctor first. What to emphasize there, and also uh, with this slide here, is the, the notion that emergency rooms, you know, Increasingly, we're beginning to deal with more and more minor cases. Um, you remember that slide from earlier on in the lecture where I showed a young boy uh, whose finger injury was being treated at home. And there you had the actor Brian Glover, who some of you may know from the series Porridge or the film Kez, uh, you know, the, the uh, rather irascible um, football coach in the, the, the local school um, you know, comes in with his injured finger and has to wait. So, and you can see here, even from the 1950s, the concern that some people just want to come to the emergency room to talk. You know, we can't be having that. You know, so so there's, a, there's a, a move on the one hand to 
try and exclude non really non urgent cases from the emergency room space or the accident and emergency space uh, because you know, as we saw from that chart that the table in a previous slide the number of visits was going up and up and up and increasing exponentially um, and what ends up happening is that you get you know, a, a, a concern around um, around the the sorts of uh, as we saw in that that uh, short film, yeah, you know, people sitting around waiting for a long time, and this is a spoof uh, ad job advertisement that appeared in the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine, two thousand and seven. A career opportunity in emergency medicine waiting room medicine fellowship, where it's talking about, uh, yeah, ED sees in excess of sixty five thousand patients a year. Much of the care provided is done in chairs, on ambulance gurneys, behind temporary curtains, broom closets, and so on. So, yeah, yeah. There's an idea that A, there's an increasing number of patients coming to these spaces. B, it's creating massive pressure on the the system itself. Um, and I'll come back to that towards the end. But you know, these are clearly important and concerns around keeping the through flow of patients going um, in the A and E. And one of the th the ways in which they do this is through um, through triage and through sifting and sorting. And so the emergency room becomes in many ways the front room of the hospital. And um, going back to you, I want to go back to Eugene Richards's observations uh, in the Knife and Gun Club, where one physician, Carl Talent, um, drew comparisons for Richards between the courtroom, the battlefield and the emergency room in terms of the immensity of what was at stake and the often hostile nature of the emergency room uh, space. And tenant, talent, talent said, it's a Darwinian crucible within which people are quickly tested and quickly disposed of and forgotten. On the battlefield, they're buried. In the ER, the patients go upstairs to surgery. Doctors come and go. The next shift comes on. And the unknown is always there. And the unknown is very fearful. So what did happen when these patients got into uh, new spaces. Well, one thing that happened, um, as Talent said, um, was that once patients come into the, these spaces, they're triaged. And functionally, and this is an absolutely crucial quote for me, this means translating their clinical condition into geographical placement. A nurse says, how are you doing? You go to room one, you go to room 21, you go to room four, you go to observation. And so this is a sort of placing, there's a sort of placing and sorting geographically within the emergency room that's going on, a spatial organisation of the patients. And when you read the histories of the emergency medical services, what you'll get if you read any of these histories is the impression, particularly from physician historians, is that these decisions uh, where patients were being placed was based on clinical criteria. And... Talent went on to say that once the patients have been put in one of the rooms that um, the nurse, you know, the nurse is directing them towards here, then the emergency physician would see the patient um, in the biological order in which they clamour for attention. A disposition is ordered, the patient is cared for in hospital or an outpatient, held for observation, or unfortunately sent to the morgue. Now, I don't want to dispute the clinical criteria were one of the ways in which patients were sorted, obviously. In fact, you know, particularly in the United States, triage was something that was you know, um, recognised and imported from the battlefields of Vietnam and North Korea, where the most urgent, desperate cases were you know, put to the front. But what the work of historians, sociologists and anthropologists has shown, and I think... Yeah, this has also been important for the present moment of the COVID-19 pandemic, is that a whole number of factors go into the triage of patients once they're in the emergency room. So the triage is a space where staff perform effectively a labour of division, um, and they sort patients into categories of good and interesting, uh, normal or rubbish legitimate and legitimate, appropriate, inappropriate. And this work, this, all these categorizations and, categor and, and um, uh, um, classifications come from the work of sociologists Heatherington and Monroe. Uh, 
And what this, what they call categorization work does is it attempts to identify whether the patients are legitimate or not in terms of their claims and, it, and you know, whether they should be allowed or permitted to make particular kinds of demands on the emergency system. So emergency rooms become significant for the work of categorization due to their position within the wider health service. Firstly, they're arguably the most open service existing at a threshold between need and care. Uh, and then they function as gatekeepers, uh, controlling access to acute care through the admission of patients to acute hospital wards. And you can see here from um, you know, this, this, this image in 1983, the modern emergency department practice, how this, uh, yeah, this admission to wards, but also different spaces in the hospital is a crucial part of the control room, of what was called the control room of the hospital. The emergency room becomes a place where, yeah, where uh, 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 then becomes a node, if you like, of knowledge and information and throughput for the hospital itself. But what this is also means is that the emergency room is a, a site of conflict between uh, the, the, the work of emergency medicine on the one hand and the categorization of patients according to professional interests of particular clinicians, but also the organizational and institutional cultures of medical practice and individual kinds of institutions, and also non-medical components of you know of people's you know, how people perceive themselves um, as sick or not sick um, and the moral worth of patients and their families and so staff tend to characterize their patients according to the type of case a patient represents but that is also institutionally constituted even you, know, you can see from this early list uh, of the of the, the, the emergence of the board in the emergency room, the, the non-emergency room categorizations that are being placed uh, on patients. So this prioritization isn't just dependent on asocial clinical truths. The emergency department's triage system is very much dependent uh, on these as, you know, as, we, we've, as we observe it uh, developing in the 1970s and 80s. So, Simple issues like uh, the time of day or night that a patient arrives um, can mean the difference between placement in one kind of category or another. The point at which a patient is seen in the course of a member of staff shift uh, can also shape clinical decision making. Um, you know, how patients react in terms of providing information, uh, their competency as a patient uh, is important or yeah, the way in which the patient themselves can assist the operation of emergency medicine also influences the decision-making process in which patients are allocated to a particular triage category. And much of this um, surveillance, if you like, gets directed towards the management of the patient in the waiting room as in the uh, the, the waiting room as the front stage area of the hospital. I'm sure we've all sat in an A&E uh, waiting room. Um, and that is that waiting room is crucial because it's physically separated from the more um, private areas of the hospital, um, which, which it's also accessible generally, certainly in the 70s and 80s and 90s, to patients who requested uh, attention. So as keepers of a queue, that you know, reception staff not just nursing and medical staff are concerned with securing an orderly and temporarily appropriate flow of patients through to the more private areas where the clinical staff then attend them. So moving patients around the emergency room became an important part of the organization of this new uh, emergency space. And one example of this uh, that I like to use is um, described by a nurse, Rita Slater, when a triage system was implemented in an emergency room. 
Previous to its introduction of triage in 1968, the emergency room nurses' time was split between giving care to individual patients, uh, but also directing patients through the emergency room space. And in many cases, uh, patients were registered um, even after emergency care was initiated. Um, what this diagram shows is the flow of some uh, example patients coming through the emergency room before triage uh, was implemented. So one patient might come in through uh, the main entrance and go immediately to screening, directed there by a nurse, uh, or a patient might come in through the uh, ambulance door and go direct to screening, or maybe they'll end up going out of a side door as well uh, after being seen. And as the solid lines show how a patient might come in through the ambulance door, be seen in the screening clinic uh, and leave again. Once the triage system was put in place, the nurse would send the patient either to the screening clinic via the registrar or to the emergency room if they needed acute care. And that patient that I've just described is shown here uh, with the solid line. But what other sociological research has shown is that these sorts of categorizations aren't just based uh, on clinical need, as I mentioned earlier. For example, Dingwall, Dingwall and Murray called it the rule of clinical priority, where at the intake, patients were sorted into three categories, those who conformed, those who were interesting, and those who were deviant. And in some senses, this isn't all that different from the sorts of categorization that were taking place in St Bartholomew's Hospital almost a century before in London. But the, as, as we saw from the previous slide, the, the kind of space was rearranged in order to make this sort of triage uh, more efficient. So what do we mean by deviant patients? Well, patients who were behaving poorly or inappropriately, or they were too naive to operate or understand the emergency uh, triage system and you know, whether a patient is appropriate uh, is uh, behaving appropriately in scare quotes partly depends on the configuration of the space itself whether they can move themselves around that space uh, in a in a, in, in a, a conforming kind of fashion patients were also seen it were then placed into different kinds of frames. Um, and yeah, they might be, if they were conforming and had relatively minor co complaints, they might be put in a what, what Dingwall and Murray termed a bureaucratic frame. Interesting patients um, quite often found themselves at the top of the pile in terms of the order in which they were seen by doctors because they, yeah, they, um, they, they were patients that it was assumed the doctors would uh, be keen to see. So there are a lot of non-clinical criteria that are going together to make these kinds of decisions to have particular kinds of patients move through these uh, move through the emergency room uh, along these particular kinds of arrows and directions. And th these sorts of decisions are being taken with the input from a lot of non-clinical staff as well, uh, clinical staff of the hospital, but also families, friends, patients themselves. Um, so it's a constant negotiation in terms of what goes on in this kind of emergency room space. Um, and physicians and academics, well, I want to finish with this. Uh, physicians and academics continue to struggle with the problems of the pressure on emergency systems. Um, this is a representation of a model of the acute care system where import, inputs are seen as emergency care, unscheduled urgency care or safety net care. And they place these massive demands, all these different categories place these massive demands uh, on the emergency department, which is then responsible for, uh, and the category here is throughput, um, where patients arrive at the emergency department and they're triaged at the place in particular room um, and they're given diagnostic evaluations and treatments uh, or they might be uh, they might be uh, put in uh, as boarded as inpatients. One thing to say about this and to go back to how I began the talk is this is all dependent on motion. Motion is absolutely crucial to the experience of patient care, the, the where, where, how and where and why patients move through the particular sort of, not just through a model, but through the, the space of the, the ER itself. Um, and so one of the things that we see here on the right is um, in terms of the output 
um, and how difficult it is once the patient has left the emergency room to access follow-up care and may be provided with adequate and suitable medical care because of a lack of available inpatient beds. Um, so we've, we've certainly seen this in the recent COVID-19 pandemic in hospital spaces. So there's pressure coming on this emergency department system in all directions. And what's it kind of, for me, one of the things that's interesting about the output is, you know, it, it is you know, the lack of access, where it says the lack of access to follow-up care. One of the things that emerged in the 1960s and 1970s was this notion of pre-hospital care and hospital care. And one, the, 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 the one of the, the ways in which this was defined was through the rise of the, uh, uh, of the high tech emergency department. The emergency department was seen as the place where definitive care was begun. Anything before that, anything pre-hospital, you know, any medical care that was given by paramedics or in an ambulance was, or, or even by the general public was seen as pre-hospital care. So you begin to get this spatialized definition of pre and definitive care and the hospital, but particularly the emergency room was the space in which this, uh, this took place and which these categories were formulated. But also what you have here, and interestingly for me, is post-hospital care as well, which is also seen as being something spatially, but all spatially beyond the walls of the hospital, but it's also temporal as well. So you have pre, during and post, which relate to outside the hospital, during is inside the hospital, and post is outside the hospital as well. So you have a, a combination of temporal and spatial differentiations of what the, what the patient journey uh, looks like. And the emergency room is absolutely crucial for thinking about how that spatial categorization is important for medical care. So what this represents is massive, uh, in, massive uh, pressure on the emergency room system. And when you get this kind, these kinds of pressures, uh, it means that the decisions that are being made in the emergency room about who gets treatment and who doesn't can't be made, not, not even aren't made, but sometimes they just can't be made on purely clinical criteria alone. Um, and you can see here, here's, uh, you know, recent, uh, a recent um, visualization of what good trauma care uh, should actually look like. But, it, it, you know, all these other kinds of um, pressures that I just mentioned, mean that this can only often be an idealized version of what happens rather than what does happen in practice. And, uh, and so what I would finish with is we could argue that the emergency room as it now exists is a space which has become a microcosm you know, from, from shifting to this messy, chaotic, um, you know, unregulated space through the development of emergency medicine in the from the 1960s and 1970s onwards into this fairly highly regulated techno medical space, uh, a microcosm. It's become a microcosm of the sorts of pressures um, and difficulties that have been faced uh, by the healthcare system more broadly. So thank you for listening. There are just a few of my uh, um, formative thoughts on how I can approach the history of the space of the emergency department, accident and emergency room, emergency room, whatever you want to call it. And I very much uh, welcome your observations and comments. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk slash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.